to the guest at Maris Consulting Series. Uh, I'm very happy to have Ian Heptingstall here with us today, and I'd like for him to describe his, his journey, his professional journey in, among other things, the theory of constraints, and his experience in capital and construction projects. Hmm. So, uh, when, when did it all start? What, what was the first word you came out as a baby? Crane? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. It took took quite a wandering route uh, until I started working on projects in the chemical industry. In fact, just after just after graduating, okay, when I uh, discovered one of the downsides of being on the receiving end of somebody else's design and conception of a project. You mean your first project did not finish on time? Uh, it finished on time because it didn't really have a program. It. Uh, a, a method that I still notice in use today okay. in that you have a, a rolling completion date. Okay, so it finished when it finished? It finished when I said it was finished and okay. that, was the, uh, that, that was the end date. And that frustrated you? Uh, it wasn't that bit that frustrated me. It was the fact that the um, it, it was to install a replacement piece of technology in a, uh, a chemical plant in yeah. the chemical industry in Cheshire uh, the equipment had been specified and bought when I was still at university doing my finals. Yeah. So when I started, my job was, hey, just install this. Right. Easy. Not knowing at all what I was doing, yeah. learning lots of things that uh, hopefully they don't allow new project engineers to do these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was great fun. The, only, the major problem with the project was the piece of equipment was two and a half times too big. Okay. <laughs> Because the the definition was done based on, well, the old one had that capacity. Uh, the new technology only comes in these steps, so I'll take the next biggest step. Uh, not realising that it was fundamentally a different type of technology. The old one could easily be turned down. Mm -hmm. So it was always working at about 50 to 60% of its nameplate capacity. Okay. The new one couldn't be turned down easily. Okay. So it was... Uh, Far too big. So, a nice example of the difference between children and adults is the price of toys, yeah? Mm -hmm. It could be, yes. It was a very expensive, good toy, but some good learning that projects uh, are things that, for me, are best looked at fully holistically. Mm -hmm. What's the problem being solved? If I'd seen my project as install this compressor, yeah. it was successful. But from a business point of view, it wasn't successful because it didn't do the job that it was needed to. Okay. So, so after doing that, what happened? Uh, well, th th then I took uh, a tour through different parts of the chemical industry, uh, including a couple of years working just up the road in Rouen, uh, having to learn French as well as project management. Um, but to me, as part of the education of a project manager, what was fantastic was it was part of a client's organisation. Mm -hmm. I saw a project from end to end. And it was only later on in my career that I realised that some people talk about projects as part of the business's project. Mm -hmm. And the, the damage that can be caused by one client project being treated as five independent steps that mm -hmm. don't coordinate very well was mm -hmm. something I, again... I was surprised when I came across it, but uh, moving amongst different industries, when I worked in construction, even when I moved to the pharmaceutical industry, I really saw the damage of trying to chop a project up into separate stages and running each one separately. Okay, so you were discovering uh, one of the Ellie Goldratt's favourite statements about the sum of local optimums is not at all the global optimum. Yes. And you were seeing that, in fact, rather than finding any kind of win-win behaviour, uh, everybody was playing at lose-lose? Uh, in, in part lose-lose, yeah. I'll, I'll come on to that shortly, it was just rather inefficient. And, mm -hmm. and there were tales of other parts of our chemical business, almost building projects that weren't they were the wrong solution to the problem. Okay. Uh, so they started up, they ran 18 months, then they got closed down. Okay. Uh, not because of dramatic market changes, but because there were better things that could have been done. Um, now, c coming back to the win-win, lose-lose, uh, I, I first got into that in the mid-90s, where a sort of change of career meant that I, I moved to the other side of the fence. So I was no longer a client, having spent... 
nearly 15 years managing projects as a client. So not having to worry about uh, conflicting objectives and performance measures. Then I was a supplier. So I was working for an engineering consultancy, mm -hmm. uh, as they're called. We basically did detailed design, construction, construction management for our clients. Okay. Uh, and I, we, were, we were fortunate in, in winning a uh, competitive process to help manage and design a project for an American company in northeast England. Yeah. Uh, and what that that was where I came across this idea of a project alliance. Okay. It was in the mid nineties. Uh the client was actually quite interested because they'd heard some good reports coming out of the North Sea, which had been experimenting with different contracting and commercial formats mm -hmm. for putting together project teams. Because traditionally you would have somebody design a project, you would go out for a very long tender, whilst companies bid fixed prices for building and delivering what was designed. Uh, that took longer than it needed to, and more and more you found that what was designed was being designed to allow uh, selection, not necessarily efficient construction. And then when you chose the contractor, things were almost started again mm -hmm. to find the right way to build it. Very inefficient and wasteful. Okay. And you got the conflicting tensions that the contractor's main issue was, how do we make some money out of this? And if we can, we'll keep the client happy. But a happy client doesn't put food on our table and feed our families. That, that was a big conflict. Okay. So the idea of this project alliance was getting your suppliers and the client, their interests aligned, their commercial interests aligned. How do you make sure that the project supply chain, the contractors, the suppliers make more money from delivering the client project better. Okay, so, um, yep. uh, so you would discover what the project alliances mm -hmm. and how to create win-win uh, solutions in uh, construction uh, and investment uh, environments. Uh, what happened next? What else did you find out? Uh, well, that, that project was very successful. Yeah? And having worked as a client, but a recent contractor, mm -hmm. it... Firstly, it was easier for me because I, I didn't have to change my behaviours. I could work as though I was a client and make more money for my employer. Okay. And traditionally, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I'd have, I'd have had to be behaved in ways that I would not have done had I been a client. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to learn something new. Uh, so it was very successful. The client would never have achieved uh, the, their time requirements and their cost requirements doing it traditionally. I'm convinced. Okay. And I sat at both sides of the table. Uh, just after that project finished in the late 90s, I picked up this book called Critical Chain, uh -huh. written by uh, a guy called Goldratt, and thought, ah, I wish I'd have read this book three years ago because we'd have added this to the project we've just done, mm -hmm. and that would have been great. I, I hadn't, I'd forgotten. In Critical Chain, uh, one of the beauties of it is that uh, Eddie Goldratt, who wanted to try and cover the whole spectrum of the types of projects that there mm -hmm. are in the world, which are very different from IT to construction. So yep. there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a construction guy yeah. in, in, the, in the Critical Chain, I believe. There is. There's Red right. Ted. His name? <laughs> Red Ted. Red Ted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. From so, his hair colour, I believe, not his political right. persuasion. So you bought this book called Critical Chain with Red Ted in there. What yep. happened? Uh, then my career went in different directions. Yeah. And I became a very frustrated <laughs> ex-project manager for a while. Uh -huh. um, having seen what the potential is. Mm -hmm. But then I moved into a different role, which was as a senior procurement manager in the chemical industry, okay. sorry, pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Uh, so my responsibilities were not directly involved in project management anymore. Okay. And then I moved into management consultancy, working capital procurement. Um, so my career took me in a slightly different direction. Right. So I still had this thing whizzing around in my head, mm -hmm. uh, thinking, I wish I'd have known that. Right. And almost naively assuming that both both the idea of a project alliance and critical chain would be slowly taking taking on in that industry and in effect taking over because it just made so much sense to me. Turn the clock forward several years 
when um, again a couple of couple of changes of uh, of position, yeah. and I was uh, working now as a as an independent consultant. I had some time to to really research the area of uh, critical chain, its fundamental underpinning knowledge uh, theory of constraints, and. I started looking around in the construction and capex industries to see, and it seemed just like it had been 15 years earlier. Yeah. Well, what's that about? So I started to, to do some research to try and find out where these things had been used, where they'd not been used, and why not. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was hoping to find you know, proof that it doesn't work. But everywhere I looked, it was proof that it does work. And, and that was starting to niggle at me. I thought, well, I'm still too young just to say, well, it's them, I'll work for my pension. Mm -hmm. So it started sort of gnawing at me, right. which uh, eventually led me to uh, you know, collaborating with Robert Bolton uh -huh. and, uh, and and writing what I had in my head in a book. So you published a book. I did the... publish a book, that one there, Breakthrough Project Management. Uh -huh. Um which, as you know, you've uh, you've had a look at elements of it. The I originally just started to write down things that were bouncing around in my head. Mm -hmm. um, when I started collaborating with my co-author Robert, um, we met each other at conferences. Right, a couple of conferences once a year, uh, and Robert, like me, had had his early career in construction type projects. I was working with a client in the chemical industry. He was working as a contractor in infrastructure, roads and mines in Australia. Mm -hmm. But he had the same view. Okay. He came across Critical Chain and was involved hands-on doing Critical Chain for, for a number of years. But not in the construction industry. So we both were of this mind, hell, it can be so powerful. It can, the, the industry is having so many economic and performance problems. Why isn't it? And we came to the conclusion it was genuine ignorance. Very few people in the industry knew about it. Mm -hmm. uh, about two years ago, three years ago, I, I picked up the latest copy of one of the, the Bibles published by one of the UK professional institutions uh, on how to manage projects. Mm -hmm. Critical chain, not mentioned. Project alliancing, not mentioned. But what's this about? Mm. So... Uh, we came together, started chatting. I wanted to try and put some structure into these thoughts I'd got bouncing around, and it, it turned into a book. And now we're working with people who uh, also want to give it a go and would like to make their projects better. Okay, so you brought together two ideas that have been around and, and, and proven over the past 20 years, Project mm. Alliances and Critical Chain Project Management. Mm. And that cocktail, uh, your explaining in your book how it can be applied to capital and construction projects to make them finish faster, about a third faster and, yep. and cheaper. Definitely. And uh, all this without compromise and on time and everything. Yeah, without having to cut corners, cut quality. Quality will probably increase. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Philip, it's one of the, the spin-off benefits of critical chain. Yeah. You know, delaying until you need to start something, mm -hmm. but also having the team uh, looking out for each other's backs. And if you can get that into a project team, the chances of uh, small mistakes becoming big ones are just significantly reduced. Okay. Well, I, I've read the book and I, I really like it. It's, uh, it's uh, a very nice modern format, 130 pages or so. If that, yes. Uh, um, and not too many words per page and lots of diagrams and stuff. So I, I like it. <laughs> no, no, and it's, yep. no, it's, it's really well written. Um, and um, it's... Uh, very convincing. I know the I know the critical chain part mm. of it because we, we do that. But uh, uh, it was very interesting for me to read about the uh, capital construction side, which I, I, I don't know well, and also uh, even to, to, to understand what the challenges facing capital construction projects have that I also have met in other kinds of projects because quite a lot of those things are, are things that uh, turn up in, mm. other, in other environments. In fact, yeah. Robert and I put together something which we addressed at construction and capex yeah. projects. Mm -hmm. However, the the generic feature is projects where most of the work is done with a contract in the way yeah. by third parties. Um, without that, critical chain by itself 
works fantastically well as you and mm. your clients over decades have found. But once there's a contract in the way, things become more difficult. Sure. And we wrote it to let people in the industry know that, look, critical chain has been used tens of thousands of times, uh, billions of dollars worth of projects, particularly in Japan, public sector infrastructure, have successfully been managed using this method. Yeah. Project alliancing, mm. although it started in Europe, would have diminished to a niche until the Australian government spent over $30 billion worth of infrastructure projects based on alliances in the public sector. Mm. So it's all doable. Really good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I recommend the book. It's really good. It's really good. Okay. Thanks very much for it.